they survived the California fire, but they grew better. Terms. Um, first of all, my family brought coop. So that came up several times in the discussion about the workshop. And people were expecting it, and they always do expect it, but my reason for not doing it, as I used to, is uh, everybody knows how to do it. It seems to me that when you come to a workshop, um, actually, it should, it's best if it's demonstrate talk about something new. It was so easy in the beginning. Uh, 35 years ago, and I probably was asked to do my first workshop, many of the people in the audience didn't have any experience with uh, high fire snowware clay, so you could talk all about that. And a lot of people didn't even know the basics of making lids on jars or trimming the feet, throwing was all you really needed to demonstrate. Then they all learned all that because we went out and did workshops. They had to come up with some other information. And for me, it turned out to be, uh, well, for a while, I was just going around showing people how to throw very, very tall pieces because that's what I was interested in by uh, adding donuts of clay and extended throwing, not, not coiling or slapping, but just starting addition on another wheel putting it on top. When I stumbled onto the Rock Coop process, of course, that was a natural. And uh, in the beginning, I always had to carry my own uh, fuel can. And in the fuel can, I carried uh, my little blower, my burner, oil burner, I carried tongs, glove, everything collapsed. And I could come into a school and say, well, if you have about 200 bricks, doesn't make any difference what kind they are, just house bricks or fire bricks or soft bricks or whatever. Uh, I'll demonstrate making rock food. And basically, some of you probably were in some of those workshops here where we did it, I uh, forget where, but in the yard somewhere. I remember lots of smoke. <laughs> um, and I con continue to do that probably until about six years ago, and a seven. At which time, I realized that um, I wasn't giving anything new. It was still a lot of fun. Everybody enjoyed it. But what really sort of convinced me, I suppose, or two, two events in the last few years convinced me I didn't need to demonstrate rock food. I can still talk about it. But um, one was uh, a trip to Russia while it was still the Soviet Union. Actually, it was in Latvia. Um, one of the other participants in the symposium handed me a book. Uh, it was in uh, Hungarian. And it, I asked him to translate it. He says, Raku for children. <laughs> <laughs> the other one was about uh, two years ago. Um, I was explaining to some friends who were visiting my interest in, in uh, making some metal vessels. And they said, oh, that's already been done. Uh, we saw some down, downtown in one of the gift stores, one of the galleries. And I said, oh, really? Let's go look at them. So we went down, and they pointed out, about, there were hardly say dolls, but there were something like these metallic looking cartoon pieces. So I, I said, no, no, those aren't metal, those are clay. Yeah. And I thumped them with my finger to convince the guy that they didn't ring, you know, like metal. And of course, the young storekeeper came running over. Please, please, please don't touch the artwork. So, I said, what can I help you with? I said, well, we just had a little discussion going. My friends think these are made of metal. I said, they're made of clay. He said, they're neither. 
really is not separate, but all one and the same. Then this afternoon, uh, right after lunch, we're going to look at slides. And then the slides are partly to be entertaining, but I hope will be more instructional. Uh, kind of filling you in a little bit on some of the things that go into your work that directed, you know, influence it. Because nowadays that's very common to talk about your influences and uh, where you're coming from and what affects it and so forth. I have difficulty really talking about it, but I'm sure I better do slides. So right after lunch, that's what so we'll start with. <coughs> I will continue through the afternoon to make some pieces. I'll move off the wheel probably onto slabs, which um, need to dry out, and that's no problem here. <laughs> it is sometimes. Um, where, where, where was I last? Problem with dry. That's very easy. Was it? Oh, it is. I'm going to North Carolina next week, so I may have a problem there. <coughs> it, well, I was in Miami uh, two weeks ago. Maybe it was down there. Yes. Yes, it was. That's where it was. It was raining and muddy and cold. Yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, that'll be no problem, and uh, probably may be holding them back, I don't know, we'll work it all out. But those will be assembled from our afternoon into a, a, what I call major piece. Now that brings up something else I'd like to talk about. A few years ago, uh, I believe it was Esther Sachs, uh, I was arranging to have an exhibit with her, or showing with her at the time. And she kind of stunned me by saying, now, Paul, when you send us work, we want major work. <laughs> I thought about that for a little while. And I, first, I laughed, you know, and then I got to thinking, what do you mean by major and why? Um, I thought everything I said was of equal importance. So, without having her tell me that, thinking I've kind of figured out a few things myself and I think they have some larger <coughs> application than just talking about that incident because today that uh, there is a concern especially in the galleries um, that we send them major work so here are a few ideas one of course might be scale or size <coughs> if it's really large um, there's a certain major quality about that. We might call it, another word might call it monumental. And that reminds me of a discussion some of you may have heard in, at the Encica in San Jose a few years ago. Uh, Viola Fry, Ron Nagel, and myself were on a panel. And the moderator got around to talking about the importance of size or scale in their work. If you know their work, Viola Fry's things would hit the ceiling out here. Ron Nagel's are very small, intimate cups about this size. So they had some pretty strong opinions <laughs> about the importance of big and small and and scale and monumentality and all that. And they chatted away for about 20 minutes. And I really just want to get into the fray because I work both ways. But finally the moderator asked me, pointed to said uh, well, you've got to study things for a little bit. Don't you have some input to this whole thing? I said, oh, yeah. Reminds me of penis dog. <laughs> <laughs> Size is not important. <laughs> 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 well, size is important, or can be important. It may can make it work. Uh, sometimes price, I think. Uh, that sort of makes us think we're looking to make it work. It's very expensive. Uh, we're, it's a little easier, to, it's a little more believable, a little more credible about its importance. And some people use that almost in a business sense, you know, price something very high, even though um, they have not yet developed the reputation for the demand. But that's okay, so long as it collector, the public, whoever buys it is satisfied. And many times they do want it to be expensive. We've all had it. Collectors are 
to say they're looking for a word that's been documented. And by that they mean photographed, written about, um, some historical critique or any kind of comment that's been written. Documentation makes it authentic. So much so that you've probably had this experience if you've had it exhibited and they've sent out announcements with a photo of one piece in the shelf, that's the one that's going to sell first. And that's the one that more than one people are going to say, oh, I really wanted that. So the documentation is some credibility. Collectors. Um, also are interested in what they call pivotal work. Pivotal work is work that can be seen now from a distance as having turned a direction. So I suppose my discovery of Raku for me was pivotal work. Certainly one pot in it, uh, what happened after a couple of years, of, some of you saw it, if you saw the show, my retrospective. <coughs> The big round pot had black handprints all over it with white lines. Well, that white line was an accident, and when it happened, that was a, that was a pivotal moment, and that pot was a pivotal piece. The collectors all over asked me if it's still available, but of course it's been in the collection. Fred Marr bought it and put it in his collection many, many years ago. So any, if you have any pieces that you can say, okay, here's where Here's where I changed and turned the direction, went a different way. They like that. And related to that is the seminal word. <coughs> seminal being a word that uh, has influenced and taught others or given others, uh, like start a whole new generation of ideas. I suppose Pete Bogus would be a perfect example of somebody who was a very seminal part of in the sense that what he was doing, especially in the 50s, really changed the course of clay and started everybody going in a different direction. Not everybody. There may be some other things related to making major work. Uh, I like to think of the um, quality, not a technique. A quality that's hard to define, but it's similar to yesterday Dave took me through the Heard Museum because I arrived a little early. And as we walked through the exhibit, looking at the Kachina dolls in particular, for me, and the, uh, the membranes pottery and some other pottery, I, I was struck with a <coughs> feeling that that work exudes. That's the best word I can get or use. That, um, I think I associate with major work, and I don't know what, how to define it. But I do think it's something that uh, artists struggle towards all their life. They try to get into their work, whether they're painters or sculptors or whatever. Well, questions? Anything right now that you want to talk about? Because this is a good time for me. Is that second cup of coffee done it's yet? It's still brewing. Yeah, I work a little with metal. It's too expensive to work with it a lot. I think I'm averaging about one major piece a year. <laughs> that it costs weight. I forgot to include it. Weight makes it major when you work with, it, with metal. I, I have one I just picked up last week. <coughs> so, 40 inches. I use I make the clay piece first, and there are two ways. Uh, the one that I prefer, but boundaries are not familiar with generally, um, or let's say they're not that excited about doing it my way. <laughs> I come into the into the. Uh, borrow studio if I don't have my own borrow studio <coughs> and one day I will make a major sculpture out of clay exactly thank you exactly the same way I would uh, normally um, with uh, am I coming through normally um, 
I would make it just like I was making a clay piece. I don't think bronze, I think clay. And then overnight it will harden enough so the next morning uh, I can take it to the foundry. And uh, we we lay it on its side on some cushions and we put a little, call it dike or dam, around what's obviously one side. And then we spray with a, uh, I use a, oh, it's a little hopper that they use for spraying plaster on the walls and drywall. It's an air compressor type of thing. I spray the first coating of a mixture of plaster and so of sand onto that, only about an eighth of an inch thick to, to get the detail. Then, when that hardens in about 20 minutes, we mix up another batch of plaster and sand, a little stronger sand, and also some nylon fibers. And we add that, which builds a shell around the clay. Then we turn it over and do it the other side, and if necessary, the third or fourth side, because eventually we want to be able to open it up, pull the clay out, throw the clay away, obviously. This is kind of a lost clay process. The <laughs> lost clay process. It still involves wax because at this point, the shell is the final investment into which the metal will be poured. But of course, you can't just fill up that whole thing with a solid chunk of metal. So we have to paint or pour a wall of wax into the plaster the investment. So it can be <coughs> cord filled with plaster so to so we don't have all that heavy metal in there. We don't want a solid bronze on it. You could theoretically avoid that step, but it would weigh way, way, way too much. Five hundred and eight hundred pounds. But after the uh, after that core is set up then uh, the whole thing is uh, melted out, the wax is melted out, and the bronze is heated up and poured into it. Obviously, they have to put gates and rudders and all the traditional ways of pouring the bronze in one place and letting the air come, out, come back out and having the bronze run into all the little <coughs> nooks and crannies. It's, it's a technique. <coughs> That's why I use the foundry. I don't want to get involved with that much technique. <coughs> but I like to work with the foundry. That's one way. The other way, and incidentally, that ends up with only one of a kind because that mold is destroyed to get the metal out. There's no way that you can do it again unless you use the metal and make a mold off of it. The, the second way has more to do with the traditional methods where uh, I make a pattern. Now, the pattern can be made of any material. You've never worked with bronze or in bronze. It's too hot. Um, you, you make your pattern out of anything else, wood, paper, organic material, molding clay, modeling clay, plaster Paris, Bondo, wood. It doesn't make any difference. And this is one of the things that intrigues me about metal. Most sculptors spend weeks and hours and months, sometimes years, working on a model, on a pattern, which then is taken to the foundry, and then a mold is made from it, and then um, bronze is cast into uh, well, then wax patterns are made from that, and then it's, it's traditionally cast. The one advantage that I have is I work fast, since with, that's the way I'm, I'm used to working with clay. I work spontaneously and fast. So normally, the piece I just talked about can be made in two days. The other way, using traditional techniques, is to take bits and pieces of a pot. Well, this happened one time because a piece came back from an exhibit with some things broken off of it. And I didn't really throw it away, I just set it to one side, thinking, well, I'll, I'll think about this. Maybe it's salvageable. So one time when I got thinking about making bronzes, I said, well, you know, now I can glue other pieces back onto this base. And so I looked through my scrap pile and found bits and pieces of other pots that had also broken off. Began taking things and gluing them on, putting, adding bondo, <coughs> using plaster and other things to recreate, to make a new piece, but not a clay piece, not a finished clay, not a fresh clay. And 
that was sent to the foundry, and from there they made a rubber mold. And from the rubber mold, we can make additions. And I limit the additions to five. So that's the, the two ways that I'm currently involved with. <coughs> I've been talking with some foundries who do a more modern method of casting called shell casting. Shell casting is basically <coughs> dipping the wax into a uh, small amount of well, it's a slurry. Uh, some variation on sodium silicate, I believe. A slurry that also has uh, <coughs> suspended in it real fine sand particles so that when you pull the wax out and it dries and hardens on the wax, there's a thin shell of this sandy, hard, refractory material. Then they dip it again, and next time they add a little coarser sand. <coughs> next time they dip it, and they add a zirconium sand, which is even tougher than silica sand. And the shell is developed over not more than about a quarter of an inch thick, three sixteenths of a quarter. And it's very, very strong. It's amazing how strong that is. <coughs> they can pour the hot bronze directly into it. You can even <coughs> use it with a blowtorch to melt out the wax. It has not completely melted out. It turns red hot on that spot. It doesn't crack. It's amazing. But the beauty of that system is the investment that they pour the metal into is much lighter in weight. Some of the blocks that I end up with, with my system weigh about five, six hundred pounds of, of investment. But in contrast with that thin shell, it would be much, much, much lighter weight. And also it breathes. So they don't have all the problem of getting the air out. As the metal goes in, it breathes out through the pores and it's not nearly as complicated to pass. But when I ask them, can I dip <coughs> a raw piece of clay into your slurry and build up a shell around it, they scratch their head and say, gee, I don't know, it's never been done, but I know of it. Well, it's not the way we normally do it, or, um, <coughs> uh, you know, there's moisture in the clay, and I don't think that that would work. In other words, I haven't found anybody crazy enough to <laughs> let me try it. But I will I'll find somebody who uh, will accept it. The, the, actually, there's one other reason why they don't want to do it, and it's economics. You know, they don't want to experiment with something that's going to cost them money uh, just for me to have fun or to learn something. But I will find someone, and in fact, I think I know somebody up in Denver who's, who's seen, well, I, I ran a passing the other day at lunch, and he seemed kind of interested, so I think I've got, got him hooked. <laughs> we'll go back. Pardon? Seven? Seven yeah, yeah. Can you talk to a foundry council in Montana? No. I will get to you. Okay. Yeah, nowadays there are lots of foundries all over. And it's crazy. Uh, here I was living in California and uh, Colorado. But my foundry was up in Seattle. And people said, why do you go to clear in Seattle with your foundry? Uh, the reason was, first of all, I knew the foundry owner. He had, he had graduated from one of our colleges in Claremont in sculpture. And of course, he knew me. Uh, so that that was that established a little something. And then also, um, because he he was interested in uh, working with me on uh, anything that I was interested in doing. And that's not always the way it is with foundries. A lot of foundries want to do the complete process from beginning to end. And I mean by that, you just give them a, sometimes even an idea or a little maquette. And they want to enlarge it, blow it up in there with their facilities, make the molds, cast it, and then finally even patina. Well, I was interested in avoiding as much as possible having them do everything. I wanted to enter into it. Partly because I, I, I'm always interested in how things are made. And I think that it helps you figure out some new directions. But also to cut down on the cost. Because uh, everything <coughs> they do is expensive. And he was willing to let me do that. But it was, uh, and it was also possible because at the time I was teaching and uh, one of the perks of teaching are uh, travel expenses and uh, grants. Occasionally I could get a, a grant from the school to um, 
study, research, and being an artist, that didn't mean I had to go to the library, I could go to the studio. I could go to a foundry to do my research, or a travel um, grant, which most colleges give to someone, to people in the staff, to go to professional organizations, workshops, and things like that. I was allowed to travel at the staff. But now, they retired me, so uh, I have to figure out other ways to get there. Currently, I'm working with the Foundry in Denver, which is a little closer to the last one. What else? Good question. Uh, the cast in one piece, if they're done with my lost clay technique, but they're done in uh, pieces if they're done by making a mold and uh, shell casting. The reason for that is simple. The dipping <laughs> point, uh, which has slurry, is limited in, in the size. And um, they say that's the main reason. They say they, they theoretically can dip anything up to the size of the tank. So if the tank is 24 inches across, 24 inches deep, you can't make it any bigger. <laughs> so they have to cut pieces off and dip them separately, or make molds separately. They do make molds off of the pieces that way. I was a little, a little worried about putting the pieces back together. Would they go back together so they look original, so that you know marks where they join them? Because you have to weld the pieces back together. These bronze pieces have to be welded with a TIG welder. And that obviously is going to not look like the clay. But there's one thing in my favor. My work organic. <laughs> so much so that I can't tell where they welded. <laughs> it's got my clay. And so that part's working much better than I thought. Uh, if, a, if it were a polished surface, absolutely smooth, then they would have to spend hours and hours of chasing the color, which is uh, refining the surface to make it look like the original. And if I had for example, if I had an imprint of a, of a shoe, which I use a lot, a running shoe, they would have to imitate that pattern where the seam went, and that'd be very difficult. Also, that there is another advantage of uh, working so organically. In fact, uh, this happened this summer. I was invited to send some work to the Traver Gallery up in uh, Seattle for a major comprehensive clay show they're having. And uh, I sent them two pieces, and Mr. Traver called me and said, Paul, well, unfortunately, one of them arrived with a wing broken off of it. And I said, yeah, well, what do you think? Uh, he said, well, uh, that's why I'm calling you. We're wondering if we uh, should try to glue it back together for the show. And I said, well, um, I just said, look, broken off. And he laughed. He said, Looks good. <laughs> Looks like the rest of it. <laughs> because I break off sections a lot anyhow. I said, okay, go ahead and show it. Don't bother to repair it. Maybe it's better. You remember Michelangelo's uh, rule of uh, good sculpture. You could roll it downhill and whatever it broke off, you know, what remained, that was good sculpture. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions before? What is the cost of the oh, uh, On average, this this two hundred and twenty <coughs> some pounds um, will be between the bottom price. I would say would be about eighteen hundred dollars for the casting to five thousand, depending on the on the foundry. The same piece. You have to get bids if you're interested in the cost. You have to get bids from boundaries because uh, some, some of them don't need your work, some of them really want your work, some of them, uh, this first one that I started with, I think he made a mistake, but he could also have tried to get me started in his boundary because he only charged me 900 and he said the next one's going to cost you 18 and I said, yes, I understand, I, I think you didn't charge nearly enough. And he said, well, we didn't calculate it correctly. We thought it was going to be an easier job. We thought it would be lighter. But 
that we've made a piece, we realize that we're losing money. So, around 2000 is what I expect might cost, uh, but they can go up to five, six thousand just for the same piece. And of course, the bigger you go, the, the more expensive it gets. Which became a problem in a gallery where I've well, a gallery, in fact, in Beverly Hills that invited me was the first one to suggest I try making my pieces into bronze. So I thought, well, he's a natural to be the first one to try to show it. And when we got around to pricing, uh, I was really <coughs> stumped because the clay pieces that I was showing were selling around 5000 And that meant that I couldn't sell the bronze around 5000 that's what I thought. So I said, well, maybe about 12000 maybe for this? And he said, no. He said, you don't have a reputation in bronze. You have a reputation in clay. And it's you're going to start all over like a young student. <laughs> and I said, well, gee. Um, <laughs> I've been on one for a long time. <laughs> um, what, what do you suggest on prices? So he said, well, what was your cost? He said, well, 2000 for the mold. Uh, so that was uh, divided by five pieces, that was $500 a mold. It's not quite right mathematically, but he, he said around $400 a piece is for the mold. And the casting cost 2000 so you've got roughly 2500 with no labor or any artistic Whatever built into it. I said, yeah, that's what I was thinking. Now, if I sell it to you at 2500 your, your cost is 5000 5, right? Because you're going to double it. And I get nothing out of it. I'm just to pay the bill. And he said, that's what I'm expecting. That's what I would recommend. He said, let's do it that way. And we'll tell the um, collectors that's what's happening. That this is a kind of like a gamble. And if they want to buy the first one cheap, the second one goes up a thousand dollars. The third edition goes up a thousand dollars. The fourth goes up a thousand. So that's kind of the way I've, I've done it. And I'm currently in my fifth edition. In other words, I have been able to sell four of them. But each one is a thousand dollars higher. So I guess we're now up to where I thought maybe it should have been in the first place. But that was an interesting experience. And not belittling, but. Uh, Brings you down a little bit. <laughs> Humbling. From the way you explained it, it sounds like you're making basically a bronze clay piece. Mm -hmm. Why? Any, yeah, why? I would, when you first said about doing metal, I thought a hop off in a new tangent, but, no. but I get it. It sounds like maybe that doesn't. No, it hasn't. I'll tell you honestly why. The question is why. Do, Am I making bronze clay pieces? When I first thought about making bronze at all, the question arose in my mind, now what am I going to make? And I thought about it, and I thought, well, gee, I know what I should make if I wanted to make some money. I should make some cowboy and Indians. Yeah. <laughs> make some, some dolphins or sea dolphins, or should make some mermaids, or some sexy, some erotic something or other, or abstract. In other words, I knew what was current and what's been popular and what sells. But I am Taurus. And you know Taurus, besides being very lovers, are also <laughs> stubborn people, really. And, and they don't like to do things the way they're supposed to. So I thought more and more, I said, no, I'm not going to make dolphins. <laughs> but what can I make? And eventually it occurred to me that um, there was a wonderful tradition of in China many, many years ago, bronze vessels. And um, I hadn't seen much or knew much about bronze vessels ever since. So again, this was my decision. This was a gamble. I wonder if there's a possibility that people will accept a bronze vessel. And I still don't know. I haven't got that answer. The other reason, of course, for making bronze is it can be put outdoors. And that's been a question people have asked me over and over and over about, especially around Iraq, Kuh, and Lopar, and Salt. 
um, can this be put outdoors? And I said, no, no, no. Think of it as a painting. You wouldn't put your painting outdoors. Mm -hmm. Well, the bronze can be put outdoors. Um, the other reason, of course, is uh, shipping these things nowadays. Um, well, the bronze has kind of spoiled me in some ways because with bronze you can also make things stick out mm -hmm. that you can't do with clay and expect them to get to the clay zone. In one piece, they're going to break. So the bronze can be shipped. That was another good reason. Then there's a there's a seductive, I think, kind of quality in bronze that glows from inside. There's a kind of glow. I can't associate even with glaze. Glaze has its own kind of seduction and beauty. Bronze has a different one. <coughs> I think those are the major reasons that are used to justify. Plus, the other being that about every 10 years, I seem to try a different direction. And it's not something I calculated in the beginning or, <coughs> or even am aware of as, as I go along. But in retrospect, looking back, I can see 10 year kind of increments. The first 10 years were involved with the traditional stoneware, functional utilitarian, and the really tall stoneware floor pots. The next 10 years were the work with the opposite, the real small little inlet raku pieces and a whole new technique and process and philosophy. <coughs> then the next 10 years became more uh, sculptural, um, less functional, in fact, uh, less decorative less embellished, because as they got sculptural, there wasn't any room left to draw or embellish. So that kind of went out the window, and that became my low, low salt method, which I can talk about. And I guess the bronze now is the most recent kind of deviation or evolution, I think. That's, I like that word, evolution. It reminds me a little bit. Sometimes people want to know about the clay revolution that Volkus and some of us were involved with back in the 50s. And I have to straighten them up and say, hey, it wasn't a revolution. We weren't angry at anything or anybody. We weren't trying to knock anything. It was an evolution. It simply changed. It just grew from one place to another. Um, it sounds like the piece, the metal pieces are a little bit different. Say this different thing yeah, they, they are slightly different because I can take more liberties. Yeah. And um, especially if I don't make them out of raw clay, if I make them out of this clay, sorry, and this and other materials. Yeah. Do you use patinas? Uh, yeah, I do use patinas. Uh, it's kind of fun. Again, <coughs> I'm, I'm, well, it, it's disappointing to the um, caster. They love to do the but I want to do more on it myself. And so I take it home. They polish it up, they get it sandblasted and cleaned up. And then when I get it home, I use a wire brush on it, a wire brush, even higher polish, just to get that glow. And then I, I have several options. Uh, one of the traditional is just a brown black uh, from liver of sulfur, which you spray on it, it changes instantly. Um, if I had the time, I'd stick it in my compost pile. That makes it beautiful, patina. Uh, or if I had the time, I'd just leave it outdoors in, in L.A. and it would turn blue. <laughs> 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 I've left clay or copper out in the outdoors up there for 35 years and it's still copper. <laughs> just no. And um, of course, peeing on it is a quick, easy way to turn it green. <laughs> but I'm also... Uh, I started in art through photography, and so I know, you know a lot about photography, and, and I put two and two together recently, and, and I've had some fun telling founders about this because they apparently haven't heard of it. I'm silver plating my patina from my photography. You know, you photographers, anyone who is making photography knows that silver is part of the film and the paper. And when you expose it and then develop it, that part will turn black, but there's the unexposed that has to be removed. And 
it's done in the second bath, not the developer, but the second bath called the fixer, the acid bath. It's uh, hypothiosulfate. And it finally becomes loaded with silver, so much so that it's reclaimed and sold. Uh, before photographers realized they had a valuable byproduct, there's an interesting story out in Hollywood of a uh, plumber who was repairing the, the sinks in the processing room of this lab, film lab. They kept plugging up, and about every two months he'd be called to unplug it, you know. Finally somebody watched to see what he was doing, and what he was doing was substituting a lead pipe in the drain. He had enough knowledge of chemistry that he knew that there was silver in the solution they were dumping out, and it would plug up mm -hmm. in the pipe, and then he'd replace it. Mm -hmm. Take the silver out and charge him a little money. <laughs> Nowadays it's collected and sent by labs back to the processing plant, or a lot of places to process your own, so they tell me we have lots of little silver bars. <laughs> uh, now I got off the subject there. I lost the context. Oh, yeah. Okay, that's that's a new way to, to start the patina. I now spray it with the spin <coughs> hypo, and it instantly reacts with the silver uh, with the bronze and gives it a kind of a silvery Look, uh, on top of that, we can go back with other materials, copper, sulfate, other kinds of patinas. The first piece I did, um, he said, now, and he rubbed his hands with blade, he says, now we can make it look like Raku. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 not yet. I have to experience the metal first. I have to get that out of my system. Well, that's sort of like an instant blade. Yeah, put it on. Yeah, and it changes color. Uh, there, and there are many ways I'm discovering. Even, for example, if I just spray the piece with the silver, and then leave it outdoors and it rains, wow, what happens overnight is fantastic. It comes out of that rock. It just turns every color of the rainbow. Mm -hmm. Now, getting it fixed so it doesn't continue to change is just as much a problem as stopping the white halo from getting all white, you know. And um, I, I'm experimenting with everything from uh, spraying it with an acrylic, you can spray it with a lacquer, or you can, of course, uh, wax it, but every time you add something, it's going to change it somewhat. You have a question. Being a chemist, I was thinking you could use all kinds of solutions and just dump see what you've got. Mostly the dilute acids, various ones, will give you different results. Right. And, uh, it is fun. It is. The, the patina section is always poisonous. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You have to be very careful. Very careful. Right. Where you get it and what you do with it when you do it. And it's fun to just try <laughs> common things, too, like Ajax, oh. you know, chlorine. Salt. 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 Yes, salt is very powerful. Mm. Can I ask one question? It's kind of on the subject, but after the length of time you've been involved with the play, have you experienced any health problems connected to that? My back. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. I've often said, you know, uh, people are worried today about the fumes, about the silicosis, about you know, all that stuff. I say, oh, those are not our problems. That's a kind of paranoia. The potters have problems with hernias. Hemorrhoids and backs. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I do have a bad back problem. In fact, uh, it was problematic as to whether I would be in recovery right now or in surgery or whether I could do this workshop or not. Uh, this developed about four years ago um, pain and then numbness in the feet and eventually um, went to. Uh, neurosurgeon and went through the, the MRI scan and uh, he could show me that by <laughs> remind me to change his throwing on a potter's wheel, I guess, has been part of it. Standing on my left foot, going on my way to my left foot, then trying to control the pedal with the right foot, and then bending over on the right side and then forward and then tugging. I had to switch my fourth and fifth lumbar that slid over each other. That does two things. It crimps the 
nerves. It also narrows the passage uh, through which the amount of cord goes. And then just old age is also, I guess, developing in arthritic uh, growth, so that it's called spinal stenosis. It sounds terrible, but it means <laughs> closing of the... Uh, and I don't know. Um, I've talked to some people who've had surgery, and, and um, doctors today can do miracles. Um, I keep trying to get some perspective on it. I, I keep saying, well, I'd like to live another 30 years, uh, so maybe I ought to make myself young again. <laughs> I'd have to scrape that out. I don't know. I, I'm, he's very young when I have this problem. And he thinks a kidney is a perfect uh, solution. How's that? A kickwheel. A kickwheel? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I, I used the kickwheel briefly, but I know very definitely if you uh, try this and think it's yourself, stand on your wheel, just as I've done. And right away, you see, I'm going into a bend, and then I go forward. Now, the person who told me about this problem is John Glick who also has a bad back. And uh, he ordered, you know, I used to manufacture pottery wheels, and one of our models had a fixed pedal. It wasn't <coughs> it didn't move around. It was fastened under the table. And he wrote to me, it was on the right-hand side, he wrote to me and said, I want my wheel with the pedal on the left side. And I asked him why. And he explained that to me, that if you're throwing on the right, then you should put your weight on that side because all you're doing is moving up and down and not also going to one side. Try it. You'll like it. It makes a lot of difference. But other than that, I've not had any health problems with the, with directly from the empire. And good lungs. And, you know, I, <laughs> uh, I don't jog. I did years ago just but then I decided that wasn't going to be necessary because uh, the act of uh, wedging clay is one of the best cardiovascular exercises. <laughs> I was even thinking of uh, marketing that at one point. <laughs> you know, a ball of clay is about 20 pounds in instructions. Of <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I think if I can't, then I can blame it on the wheel. <laughs> it's always easy to blame it on the clay or the wheel. Blame it on something. Yeah. Maybe hey, you could talk about, uh, you know, how you came up with your design for the wheel, like we were talking yesterday. Oh, yeah. About how they came to be, you know, most wheels came to be just kind of a design or not some other. Yeah, that was a funny experience. Uh, when I first started, I really didn't know anything about clay. In fact, uh, this is sort of interesting, thinking about influences on your life. And uh, I can now look back and say there was one moment, one day, in 1933. <laughs> You're that old? I was 12 years old, I guess, something like that, maybe younger. But anyhow, my dad took me to the Chicago World's Fair. And I was really blown away by three things. One was a sky ride, which is like a ski lift going horizontally across the ground. I thought that was wonderful. And that kind of, I think, influenced my interest in building things and making things, and things that ran, things that worked. The other was a, a an Appalachian potter throwing pots, kicking on a kick wheel, kicking barefoot, but you know, I was just amazed at the way the clay moved in his hands, and, and that obviously had some effect on me, I believe. And the third was in the midway, uh, a woman came out on the balcony with fans. Her name was Sally Rand. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
but uh, when I decided to make the play, all I really knew about it was from watching that first guy, and then my Boy Scout leader, which also was a quite, I think, influential effect on my life. A good Boy Scout leader. Some Boy Scout leaders are very militaristic, but he was an art teacher to start with. So, uh, and I would go help him go dig clay. We we never really made pots in the Boy Scouts, but I knew he did. And I remember him firing a kill with all the noise that goes along with the oil fire burners. But eventually, when I got to college, um, well, first of all, I, I was not an artist. I knew that. I was, and, and the reason I knew it was that in the eighth grade, uh, we were invited, <clears throat> we were allowed to uh, paint anything we wanted to one day because the teacher didn't have a lesson plan. And you know, one of those three days. And I decided to paint a sunset. I guess I'm more romantic in that sense than I'd like to admit, but, or sentimental than I'd like to admit. Anyhow, uh, he held it up and said, oh look, Paul made a fried egg. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> I was not an artist and I that, that confirmed it. And I wouldn't go near the art department all through high school, but by the time I got to college, um, at least I had a, a hungry, is that the word? I had an itch to do something with my hands. I was headed into pre-med mostly because the mother of the girl I was dating thought it was a good idea. <laughs> my doctor and family. But then the Second World War came along and uh, I was drafted. I was a conscientious objector. I was a medic in the Army for three and a half years. And uh, by the time I came back to finish college, it was the last semester of the senior year. I couldn't remember the latissimus dorsi of a poor frog anymore, so you know, I decided, and I also broke up with a girl early on, <laughs> so it wasn't necessary to pursue that, and it was an opportunity for me to try the art department and to explore it. Well, I explored it mostly initially um, through photography, because I was so embarrassed about drawing that I, I knew I didn't have talent. But Luckily, the old man who was teaching the art department, the one-man art department, an old Russian, was extremely permissive in the best sense. And when I approached him and said, you know, I, I'm afraid I can't draw, I don't want to draw, but I would like to take art, could I use a camera? Could I use a photography? And he very kindly said, well, that's, that's all right. I don't know anything about it. But there's an empty closet if you want to build a dark room in there. And uh, only one problem, you have to sign up for a pastel drawing. <laughs> <laughs> so I signed up for pastel drawing. Uh, built a little dark room and, and uh, began to get some encouragement. Through all of this, um, slowly evolved um, more and more uh, experience more and more security about being an artist, even though I, I knew I was not an artist. And that still persists as a subconscious problem. I don't know what the hell an artist is. Um, people say I'm an artist, and I look at them and say, well, how do you know you're an artist? What is it? I don't know. But it doesn't matter. Uh, at least it's, it's fun, you know, doing what I'm doing. Now, I was starting to answer a question there, and I lost that sentence. Wheels. Wheels. <laughs> Back to the wheels. Um, at some point after the photography uh, episode, I asked this old gentleman, could we make pottery? And he said, yes, but I don't know anything about throwing. All I know is how to make molds, because he was a sculptor. He said, I'll teach you how to make mold, but you're going to have to teach yourself how to make pottery. So first thing is get out the Popular Science or Popular Mechanics magazine and find an article on how to build a potter's wheel. First you start with Model A Ford crankshaft. <laughs> Keep the flywheel on the bottom and the bearings and you mount it vertically. And 
and then you take the brake drum off and mount that on the top for a head and fill it up with plaster Paris. And then to make it work, you uh, have to put an eccentric down here, uh, working with a connecting rod and over to the crankshaft. Then you guys tore a car apart, you know what I'm talking about. And I had a big potter's wheel. Potter's wheels also in those days were built about this big high. And it was a traditional potter had to climb into it in the morning to go to work, and then the apprentices would bring in clay, and he'd throw all day, and then they'd haul pieces away and bring in more clay. So that's the way the first potters were made. Then I, I began to uh, become more interested, and I read uh, Bernard Leach. Now, he had a whole different kind of a potter's wheel. His was a three-legged one, and uh, it also had a kicking thing, but it was more comfortable. You sat down to it, it wasn't quite as high, but it was pretty high. So I built one of those, and uh, when I decided to get into clay seriously, and that's another story, but, uh, I moved west to study with Pete Volkus and uh, dragged this wheel with me in my little trailer, and along with the diapers and everything else. And, uh, got to school, and uh, this is a brand new school, Otis Star Institute. At that time, called the Lotus, the Los Angeles County Art Institute, and they had invited this young potter to come out of Helena, Montana, by the name of Pete Bocas, to come and teach the, the, the program. And when I met Pete, um, I had shown him some slides, some photos of my work, and he looked at them and kind of said, "Well, uh, it's, it's beginning." <laughs> uh, he was very kind, accepted me. Turned out I was the only student. <laughs> <laughs> you go to a new school and they don't have a reputation, you know. Somebody's got to be the first student, and I was the first one to apply. The other thing that was interesting was he said, Well, let's go downstairs, I'll show you the pot shop. Went downstairs, and it was a room half the size of this or fourth the size of this, but a sink in the corner and a table, and that was it. No wheels, no kills, no clay, no slap rollers, nothing. Not even wear boards, no mixers. So we spent the first month, six weeks. Um, I'd go to the class, you know, and Pete would say, let's get some coffee. So we'd go across the street to what would be similar to Denny's, and get a cup of coffee, and uh, he'd say, well, let's go out to UCLA today. Let's go down to University of Southern California, let's go down to Long Beach, let's go down to Advanced Kill Company, let's go to the crematorium people to build crematoriums. Let's find out where where people are getting equipment and materials and where and what's available. Which is a fantastic way for a student to start, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, not only the one on one, um, I had more education and teaching than he did. I already had a master's he only had an MFA, <laughs> and I did about teaching. <laughs> and also three years older, so I could, he could respect me. Um, you know, actually, he respected all the students. It's one of the wonderful things about Pete. You were never a student. You were just another friend. You were Paul or Donnie or whatever. But in the process, uh, he said, well, we need wheels, and uh, I know you brought a wheel along, but he said, I think we can make it better. Um, so we, all we took from it, I, as I remember, was the head and maybe the shaft. I went to a uh, company manufacturer <coughs> and made a deal with them that if they would let us use their shop and if they would help us welding and cutting and so forth, which we didn't know how to do at that time then he would give them a contract for building a kill for the school. And uh, the first wheel that we worked on was a kick wheel. Pete really designed it. It turned out to be a, a beautiful wheel. The only problem was it was like his pots, <coughs> a little heavy. <laughs> he started with a six inch channel iron going out like this and that. Four inch pipe legs, and three inch maple tabletops, and it weighed in over 300 pounds. It was fine in every respect, except for the weight. And again, it was high. Um, I was pondering that whole 
problem, I was thinking there's another way, a better way to make a wheel. They don't have to be that heavy. And I saw a person crossing the street in a wheelchair. And, you know, the light went on in my head. And I said, wow, look at that. That wheelchair is strong enough to support a heavy person, but it's light enough and collapsible enough you can fold it up and stick it in the trunk. That's the way I'm going to make a wheel. Mm -hmm. So if you think about the wheelchair, it's, it's like this, with the wheels out here and here. All I did was turn it over in my mind. And in fact, the first Potter's wheel uh, was an X frame with a bolt in the middle, and then foot pedals, or yeah, foot uh, breasts, held uh, one side of it. And, and the top was a table, and the other side was a seat, which was a truss. And if you have a truss, you don't need weight, you don't need <coughs> other kinds of stuff, you can use lightweight stuff. And I elected to use one inch pipe for the legs, and the whole thing worked beautifully. Also, I thought, <clears throat> um, it had a steel, at that time it had a steel flywheel, which we had to send out and have cut. That was no problem. So Pete liked it, and he said, uh, if I get you a purchase order, will you make eight of them for the school? And all of a sudden, you know, I'm a businessman. <laughs> <laughs> so I went out and ordered material, and, and I didn't know how to weld, so the first uh, eight wheels were all folded together with fence uh, couplings, fittings. And I'd have to uh, have machine shops <coughs> do the edits and things like that. When I got the eighth one finished, I thought, now I'll make one for myself. But I think they're silly being so high. I think I'm going to make it more, a little lower. And my reasoning was <coughs> connected with that trussing. You don't have to have all this mass, you know. The real function of the wheel hasn't anything to do with all that height or anything else. So I cut it down. I think I cut it from about 36 inches, 38, 36 it must have been, down to about 28. Pete laughed at it at first, thought it was funny, and it did look funny, but um, it worked well, it worked fine, and, and it was easier to get in and out. Of it. it was also easier to throw tall pots in, because when your arm was all the way in on the high wheels, you were limited. You had to either get up on something else, even just standing up wasn't going to do it. And I think that that's kind of where the low concept for a low wheel came into place. There was also another wheel made at that time called the Denver Fire Clay, and Thanos is old enough to remember it. Very much. Very good little wheel. Uh, it was a portable in the sense that you put it on a table and it had a string going down through a hole in the table to a foot pedal below. It was a you complete... You had to bolt it down. Yeah, you had to bolt it down. But it was a complete wheel. Um, and it came with a bronze head, a solid <laughs> brass head. Yep. It was a alternating current motor, and anybody who knows electricity you can figure this out better than I can, because, as you know, most alternating current motors only run at one speed. But this one, there was a way of moving the brushes, rotating the brushes inside that motor that allowed it to go fast and slow. The only problem was it made a loud noise, kind of like a brand. <laughs> we used to call it the growler. And... Um, it, it was quite satisfactory, and that's where we, we copied that idea to make the first electric wheels. We found the company that made that motor, and it was connected with a gearbox. And all we had to do was buy this motor and bolt it onto the underside of the table and put a head on the shaft. And it was done. And it worked very well for many years. It allowed us to, the only difference we made between the Denver Fire Clay and that first wheel was to increase the horsepower. Uh, Pete said when he talked to the uh, salesman, uh, quarter horse was what Denver used. Pete said, can we get a third horse? And the salesman said, sure, no problems. Pete said, well, that's what we're going to do. Order me a third horse. And as he walked out the door, the uh, salesman turned around and said, you know, a half horse is only $20 more. <laughs> <laughs> so we started with a half horse, which allowed us to finish really tall pots. You couldn't stop the squeal. And it was satisfactory until the 60s, I believe. 
And then all of a sudden, the, uh, the motor and the change, and it turned out that uh, the company had been sold and they re-engineered it and it wouldn't work. And we kept having, it kept eating up brushes. Uh, you know, the brush, the electrical brush, it just kept eating them up. But more than that, they took it off the market. Not only because it probably was badly re-engineered, but because um, it had a problem in industry, that industry that potters didn't have. The problem was that, uh, it would change its speed. If, if you try to keep your pedal at a fixed speed, it would change its speed depending on whether it was hot or cold or whether you're pushing on it or it's torque or anything else. It wouldn't remain at a constant speed. And industry doesn't like that. They like to be able to set a dial and have the machine run at the same speed day after day. <clears throat> so what took its place was DC motors or direct current motors. And direct current motors prior to this time were big, monstrous, expensive, <coughs> heavy motors. And more importantly, they would only run with uh, heavy uh, rectifiers. The alternating current coming from over here wouldn't run a direct current motor. In between, you had to have a rectifier. And that was like a big battery charger with all kinds of tubes and stuff, and heavy and expensive. But transistors took the place of tubes. and uh, a little thing called a bridge rectifier uh, became available. It's only about an inch square. That would take this voltage, turn it around to direct currents, and now we could run the motors. The other advantage was that they also discovered how to make what's called a permanent magnet field uh, magnet, replacing wires. They used to always have to wind a coil or coils to the magnetism in the field. That added a lot of cost, added a lot of weight. So once they invented the uh, <coughs> permanent magnet, my magnet is catching up with me. <coughs> uh, suddenly, <coughs> uh, they took off, they took the other wheels to, which we had been using, took them off the market, and we were faced with a dilemma. The dilemma was we had to teach ourselves now how to work with DC current, how to make a foot pedal that would change the voltage and allow the wheel to go from slow to fast. In the end, it turned out to be a much better solution. In fact, it turned out to be such a good solution that kick wheels are almost obsolete. We used to say, well, a kick wheel is quiet and a kick wheel is more sensitive than everything. But I tell you very honestly, uh, the electric wheels have gotten to the point where they can't replace kick wheels in terms of quietness and sensitivity. So that's the story. <laughs> Along with them. <laughs> what about the clip-on wheel? Ah, oh, the clip-on wheel, that was one that I... <coughs> <coughs> talking about frames, right? That's what this whole thing started. Put under your arm and walk away. Right. Um, one day, you know, I'm a grandpa. And one day I was watching, and actually this was before the kids were born, so I guess I was just curious, in a restaurant, I was watching how they put a, a baby chair onto the side of the table, you know? I think it's called a sassy chair. Anyhow, I, I looked at that, and the light off went off again in my head, and I said, wouldn't it be great to make a potter's wheel you just clip on the table like that? And I said, once I get an idea, I get stubborn, I'm gonna make it work, and I follow it through. So I went through quite a few design experimentations still, I finally worked, worked one that uh, worked it out. And it was lightweight enough that I could carry it on on the airplane and stow it in the overhead. And I remember doing that one time, and the stewardess asked me as I came on, and said, what's that? And I said, it's a potter's wheel. And she just broke out and laughed. She said, no, that's not a potter's wheel. She said, I take pottery. I know that's not a potter's wheel. And I said, well, it's a potter's wheel. And, uh, and we carried a foot pedal in a separate box. And wheel up here. It was designed for portability, obviously. And it's great for people doing fairs or going to schools to demonstrate because you just pick it up and take it. It was designed for saving space. You could stick it under the counter in your kitchen. It was designed for um, paraplegics and uh, people in wheelchairs because you could roll up to the table and use it. It was also designed to eliminate shipping costs overseas and it has and continues to be very successful. It does 
and it actually we broke it down into a kit <coughs> where you put it together by yourself. <coughs> The uh, components could be broken into a kit, and let's say import tax. If you send the pieces instead of the finished pieces, so it was a it was a help. Yeah. On the wheels, well, that's that was another frustrating experience making wheels. Throwing is related to uh, horsepower, but we don't have a regulatory uh, what do you call it? <coughs> office. We don't we don't regulate like uh, tires wheels are not regulated by the government. So you can claim anything you want to claim. And I ran into problems with some other wheel manufacturers that were claiming horsepower twice or three times what the actual horsepower of the motor was. And when confronted with that. <coughs> Um, and I had to confront them with Get it all finished trimming. There's a lot of weight down in here. I'll trim that off to the inside curve and end up with a really massive top. One well, of the nice things about it is you can just pick it up, distort it, and drag it back. Very easy. Now, one time Bob Brent uh, became a close friend of mine, believe it or not. So close, in fact, he was dating my daughter. <laughs> and we almost had murdered there, like the house of Hasper joined with something else. <laughs> Not quite. But we kidded each other, uh, even though we were competitive and had different ideas. And uh, one day, Bob said, uh, you know, when we go to Nsika conferences, it's nice to show a new piece of equipment. Uh, people like to come and see what's new. He said, next year I'm going to have a wheel that throws square pots. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Uh, how are you going to do that? Well, he said, it's going to work on a cam. It's going to go this way, and it's going to go that way. I say, okay. So through the year, I, I got thinking about it, and I discovered an emergency. Now, sometimes uh, emergencies uh, are the impetus. Dave and I were also talking about workshops being the impetus to, you go out on a limb because uh, you're faking it, you know. <laughs> Maybe you're in trouble, I don't want to admit it, so you 
goof it around and do something they never did before to save it. But then that can become a learning experience. Anyhow, uh, I came back from uh, a trip overseas and I looked at my calendar and I realized that I had uh, an exhibit coming within about a week or two, something like that, which I'd forgotten to prepare for. So I, at the time I was making pots, and you saw them in the show, where I would first throw up like a football or a round ball. I would let that harden, the next day I would add a foot to it, turn it on the side, add a foot, and then the next day after hardening, I would turn it over on the other side and put a top, all of which took, you know, time. And I thought, I don't have time anymore. I've got to figure out a faster way to do this. And the, the light bulb went off, and I, and I said to myself, well, if I throw it upside down, I can finish the bottom now and avoid that extra. Well, it opened up another shape, also a new way of thinking, because when I turned it over, I had all that excess clay to play with and to manipulate, and it ended up being a, a strange-looking new uh, shape. So here's an upside down throwing pot. What's the thinnest wall you've been able to close up like that? What's the thinnest wall you've been able to close up like that? Talk to the nonslers. <laughs> um, well, there are two ways to make it thin. Thinness is important. One is uh, de-aired clay and a very smooth <laughs> texture and sand or grow up very, very fine. And then itsy bitsy finger pressure. You keep pulling and pulling and pulling. Clay that's also well aged so it won't uh, break. And then uh, you can trim it. You can put it on a lathe and trim it down. Which reminds me of my first pot. You know, I was talking about that potter's wheel, and I didn't really know how to make it, how to throw it. And in the first pot, I wanted to make it about six inches tall, so I started with six inches of clay. And then I carved the outside. <laughs> and then I carved inside. <laughs> But my teacher, who knew how to make molds, said, now we can make a mold from this, and then you can slip cast it, and that'll make it nice. But I didn't know that clay <coughs> could move from one place to the other. See, that is what's fantastic on clay. It's the only material I know of that can be moved from one place to another easily. Now, you can do it when it's hot with metal and so forth. But cold, clay will do it. People are always asking about uh, centering clay, which is moving the clay. Where is center? How do you find center? There are a lot of cliches, like um, one is, well, the center is already there. All you have to do is pile the clay up around it. <laughs> I think that's Pete. Another one of his is uh, people will ask him, well, Mr. Volkus, is that on center? And he says, yeah, yes, it is, but I'm not. <laughs> My favorite answer about centering or ideas 
idea is about sending this set down. You know, a lot of construction is to get it centered, dead centered before you throw it. And so there's a big struggle trying to get it to that point. <coughs> My feeling is that dead center makes dead pots. And there is such a thing as a live center, which you see with people like Hamada, where the clay seems to be moving off center while they're throwing it. Yet at any time you cut a piece in half, it's going to be symmetrical. All sides are going to be even. So what was happening was they were simply putting pressure on one spot, and then clay was moving in response to that pressure. The wheel is not much different from hand building. When you hand build, you know, coiling, you put pressure at one spot. When you keep going around, because you don't have a wheel to turn the pot, so you go around the pot and move the clay. Throwing only is faster because now you have a motor and a wheel that will turn the pot and you can stay in one spot. And all you have to do is put pressure on that spot. So if you are putting pressure on it, and try this sometimes, just for fun, really get it moving, then suddenly let go. You're going to have a lopsided pot because pressure is only on one point of it. Normally you have to teach students to relax gently, ease it off, and let it come back. Okay, finish this one. I'm going to close the, the bottom. I'm going to push it down, make a foot. So that's all established. At the same time, because the air is trapped in there, I can push out, down, have fun with it. And when it's tomorrow or later this afternoon when it's a little dry, I will continue to uh, work on that, taking advantage of this rollover and also the excess clay that I've left off and make a shape that will <coughs>
Stop now, but I was going to go back. Why do you stop halfway and then start to reshape it? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think if I were to analyze what I do instinctively, it would be to um, to keep the triangle as much as possible in order to get get height. Uh, the tendency is for my arm to hit the side and the clay to go wide. And as I come up, um, pulling it up from down here, I reach a point where I feel like it's just getting too wide on me. <coughs> Plus, uh, a trick I learned from working with Volkus is that you can actually throw from outside. You saw it go up. You can actually push the clay from the outside up, as long as you're also recalling it. I used to tell the students the <coughs> weakest, well, the strongest shape in, that you could throw would be a pyramid, a triangle. And the weakest is an inverted triangle. So always try to keep the, the base as wide as you can, as long as you can. You can always cut it down later. But if you're trying to get an altitude, don't let the top become an inverted triangle. So I think it's a habit that I let Deep throat technique. Don't panic. Yeah. 
That's called an aneurysm. <laughs> People think that's cheating, but uh, I'm not a purist. <laughs> where's, where's the rest of the elephant? <laughs> it's a gooey duck. <laughs> Anybody from Seattle? Yeah. Gooey ducks are? Believe us, they. You know what they are then? Finally, clean. How yeah. advantage does turning the wheel while you're cutting the bottom? What advantage does that have as to holding it still in the corner? Uh, the wheel turns it more evenly all over. And, you know, instead of just putting pressure on one side, it's evening it. I've never seen that before. Really? <laughs> 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 Uh, I also use one that's very common, and that's to uh, 
just put the lid back on but not tight, leave one side open. Or sometimes I smoke them upside down and I'll lift the can after it's been smoked real hard and stick a stone or something under it so a little oxygen can get back in. That little oxygen is important to make that white line. That white line is not part of the, it's never there until it's been fired, smoked, and then re -oxidized. And I don't know exactly the scientific reason for it, but my, my own theory, unscientific theory, is that to make the white line, first you need a white background. So I always start with a white slip, <coughs> cover the whole piece with a white slip, or most of it. I don't necessarily cover all of it because I don't like that uniform look. I like more variation. Then I will do the decoration, the calligraphy, or the embellishment, or whatever, with iron and copper. But copper is the most important ingredient. You can do it alone with copper, but I like iron just because it tames down the copper. So the copper uh, oxide, after it gets fired, becomes a metal. And we all know that copper uh, metal is one of the best conductors of heat. Now my theory is that after you've smoked the pot, it's really black. And at some point, if you can let a little oxygen get back into the kill, the copper oxide tends to concentrate or build up the heat from the walls of the pot through the conductivity to the extent that then the oxygen will burn the smoke, which is just carbon, will ignite it, will burn it away from the decoration, exposing the white slip underneath. The trick is to freeze it, to stop when it's just right. And it's difficult to know if the lid is on the pot. You can't tell. That's totally uncontrollable. That's part of what Raku is all about. Now, if you want more control, I can only suggest this. Um, it's when you burp it, lift the, uh, well, let the flames reignite. And then with your tongs, lift it slowly up through the flames and observe what's happening. If everything's working right, it's going to be like developing photographic film. You will see the white line coming off of the, off the decoration as you come through the flames. Not control, but that's what our is all about. So you you can for for say clean up and those crackles that you can both. Sure, sure. Okay. To produce a crackle, um, borrow a little bit from a Japanese red raku technique, and that is don't smoke it right away. Pull it out of the kill. Well, first of all, put your glaze on really thick. You need a lot of glaze because you have to have glass on there that's going to break. So then pull it out of the kill, and at that point it will sit some molten. Set it on the ground. Um, wait until you hear it begin to tinkle. That's cracking. That's breaking. You can blow on it. You can spit on it. Wave it in the wind. Anything to increase that. And the more you crackle, or the more tinkle you hear, the more crackles develop it. You can actually control that crackle by, by using uh, wet towels and placing it just one spot or leaves that are a, a plant, like a fern, that's wet and just lay it on there because it's going to send out crackles in that shape. Then, while it's still hot enough to reignite the paper, now you put it back in the smoking chamber with some combustible sawdust or um, whatever. <coughs> And just enough so it will create some smoke. Now the smoke will penetrate the crack. And when you open it up, it's going to go crazy. Is that how Sperry does it? No, Sperry is not the smoking species. Uh, he has a totally different technique. You see, it's one of the interesting things. You were asking a while ago about direction and how do you get new ideas and so forth. I sometimes tell people, well, one way is to do it opposite of the way it's ever been done. So read the chapter, it tells you how to correct mistakes and make mistakes. And Sperry did just that. The chapter on how to correct glazes that are crawling or crazy. He just pushed it farther 
he, he experimented with materials that shrunk even more. So that when he now puts down his slip and he draws his hands through it or whatever, he knows it's going to reticulate, it's going to craze, it's going to shrink into these beautiful patterns. But it's it's fire. It's a pretty high temperature. And not smoke. Does he use a gas or electric? Yes. Yeah. But I don't think that would make it any much difference. It's like a woman called the other day and wanted to know if I made a rock or kill and could I send her plans. And I disappointed her by saying there is no such thing <coughs> as a rock or kill. I mean, any kill will work. All you need to do is get glazed to melt, get it hot enough to absorb smoke, and you can do that in an electric kill. Oh. Mm -hmm. Did you use uh, silver Nope. Nitrate or yeah, I don't, but some people do, and nothing wrong with it, as far as I know. Uh, I had a student one year who did it. It tended to uh, feel up or melt like beads for him. I don't know exactly why, but that and they were black when they came out, but you could polish them, and for a while they were nice silver, pure silver beads. Uh, there again, the problem with it, it's going to oxidize if you don't. Cover. There's one other material besides that uh, Futura that you can explore. It's called, uh, it's an acrylic also, but it's an industrial grade of acrylic used for making concrete extra hard. It's called uh, 60. Uh, and acryl, A C R I L number 60. And it's available through concrete suppliers, that is, people who sell cement and sand and concrete block and building supplies. Now, it's a more powerful form of, of uh, this floor wax. And it may be more expensive, but it takes more dilution, so in the end, it's probably as good. Other questions? Well, some of you must be
Yeah. <laughs> 